Okay, let's say we designed a non-deterministic Turing machine. Are they more expressive than a regular deterministic Turing machine? So non-determinism, you might imagine that the difference is always the same. From deterministic to de non-deterministic, you now return a set of things. And when you see the calligraphic P, that's what it means. It means a set of certain things. So in this case, it's going to be a set of outputs, right? If in a, de a deterministic uh, finite automaton, the transition is a new state. In a non-deterministic, is a set of states. So here you're going to have what is the final, you know, the destination state, what is the value that you're writing to the tape, and what is the direction, right or left, and you want to do a set of these things. So, in a deterministic Turing machine, a configuration history is linear, you know, it's just one configuration after the other, and by knowing all of them, by knowing the sequence of them, so the configuration history, you are able to know directly whether a string is accepted or rejected. With a non-deterministic Turing machine, as before, the configuration tree is now a history. The configuration history, sorry, is actually this graph that I called a derivation graph, right? It's going to be the same thing for non-deterministic Turing machines, right? You're going to start in certain state and with the same input, you might move to three possibilities. I could move this way or that way or that way, and then I have more options and so on, right? So in a Turing machine, the configuration, you can think of it as a tree. Actually, in the derivation graphs that we've seen, we don't use a tree because we kind of reuse. We use like a DAG, a, a cyclic graph, since if it's the same state in the exactly same position, we, we put two outgoing edge. Let's say this transition would go to something equivalent to this. We would move directly there. That's why if you're, as, if you're asking yourself, why is it that in our, when we wrote NFAs and PDAs, it wasn't a tree, it was a graph. But in the book, maybe they say that it is a tree. Well, if it's only a tree if you don't want to conserve space. But if you want to conserve space, then it becomes a, a DAG, as, as a single state might have two ancestors, right? Two incoming edges. Okay, so ignoring that, putting aside that digression, um, it might not surprise you that a non-deterministic configuration now becomes a tree or a graph. So let's just think of the case where it is a tree and we really are not concerned about space and showing everything in the slide. As we know, if we have a, a tree like this, knowing whether a, a certain input has been accepted is a matter of just finding one single path. So in this case, it would be this single path is enough to confirm that this given input, in this case, A, A, B, is actually accepted, right? So if it is accepted, it is accepted if we just find one. You don't have to find all. To say that a string is rejected, then you have to look at all possible states, right? We have to look at the whole tree and convince ourselves, yes, I've seen all, and then I, I've seen all possible uh, leaf states, and they're all non-accepting states and therefore my string my input string has been rejected right so how would we go about and simulate a turing machine simulate a non-deterministic turing machine so the question is are turing machines less expressive than non-deterministic turing machines and the answer might surprise you <laughs> so the answer is they are as equivalent as so they're equivalent as expressive as. So a Turing machine and a non-deterministic Turing machine are, have the same level of expressiveness. So what that tells us is that I can use a Turing machine to simulate a non-Turing machine. So how do I do that? Well, the way I do it is very simple. The way I do it is I will use my Turing machine to actually encode the, 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 this history. Right? So I'm, I'm going to have a way to represent this history. And my Turing machine, what it's going to do is it's going to be traversing breadth-wise. It's going to do a breadth-first search to try to find 
one state that uh, is accepted. So in this case, after four steps, four levels, I would be able to figure out that my input is indeed accepted. And if you think about it, that's what we do when we convert from um, NFA to DFA. What we're actually just doing is we have to go, we, we start from the initial state, we think about all the outputs, we do a transition, we calculate the epsilon, and then we do another input, epsilon input, epsilon input. Whenever you do any of those interleaves, what you're trying to find is you're just doing a breadth first search. Right? That's basically what you're doing. So if I want to use a Turing machine to simulate a non-deterministic Turing machine, I want to do a breadth first search. There is a unique tree for each input, right? There's no two trees, there's a single way you can you can write an algorithm that yields this tree and it's always the same that's actually how i generate the the graphs for the the classes right i have an algorithm that goes through my um goes through the input iterates for each state checks for each input and figures out what is the next one and it does that until it builds this whole tree right so if i do that turing machine should be also be able to do that Right. So how do we do this? The idea is we enumerate the machines and because our numbers can grow and can be any sequence of numbers. So what is a, a path? A path is telling, telling me how am I going to navigate this, this whole tree. So let's see. What I do is I use a sequence of choices. So if I want to if I want to write 1-1, one, one, what that means is I'm going to use the first option, first choice, and then first choice. So that would lead me to this state. Then let's say I want to do 2-2-3. Two, 2-2-3 two, three. Two, two, three is simple. 2, second choice, second choice, third choice. Okay. Then let's say I want to do 2-2-2-1. Two, 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 okay. 2-2-2-1. Two, 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 so if I write any possible sequence of numbers, that means I'm writing a path according to this graph, right? So this graph doesn't change. For, my, for a fixed input, it's going to be always the same graph, right? So if I think about it, my Turing machine that is simulating a non-deterministic Turing machine, what it needs to be able to do is it needs to be able to compute all possible paths, right? I look at all these paths. These paths are giving me paths across this tree, right? So I can actually grow them. Think of it like an iterator over a list, right? What you're doing with it, an iterator over the list is the way you, you operate an iterator, if you've learned that, I hope, in probably 3.10 or something before that, is you have uh, two methods. One that checks what is the next element and another one that says, do I still have uh, an element next, has next? The other one is give me the next element. So what would be an iterator of this tree? If it's a breadth first search, it would be one, and then would be two, and then would be three. First, second, third. What would be the, the next element if I want to do breadth first search? Okay, I could do one, one. Okay, here there are no more choices. So I could do, do two, one, and then two, two, and then two, three, and then three, one. If there are more choices, I would do 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, and so on. So, if I generate my sequences sequentially, I do 1, 2, 3, and then 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3. What I'm doing is I'm generating a sequence. And this sequence is going to be a unique path across this graph, right? And with this unique path, by, by doing this sequentially, I generate first one, and then one, and two, and three, and then one, one, and then one, two, and three, and so on. What I'm doing is, I'm doing breadth first search. Isn't that great? So what you're doing is, you're, as you're generating the sequence of numbers, that's what the Turing machine has to do. So it has to have a way to generate the sequence of numbers that is ever-growing. And as it grows, you're iterating breadth first search over the configuration history. By doing that, what you have, finally the next step is produce the next element of my path, 
check where do you reach is that an accepted state okay so that's two things that you have to do the difficult part of your Turing machine is how do I generate this endless sequence of numbers and then I have a way to navigate over my states and I know how to given an, given a, a non-deterministic Turing machine I should be able to know how to execute a, one of these paths and then I can find what is my state is my state accepted if it is I'm done otherwise generate next num next path is that accepted no generate next one generate next one generate next one generate next one so on until you find this one and you're good to go that's the intuition and indeed it is the case so then in the re in the last slide I'm just summarizing what we've learned okay in the beginning of the slides there are a few videos that it that give you um, another intuition of how to the equivalence between Professor Harry Parters and Dan Gus Fields are videos that are covering these subjects. So please feel free to uh, watch them as well. Okay, I hope you had fun. Have a good one.